today I'm excited because we are starting a brand new series. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. I haven't even told you what it is and you're excited, so that's good. Uh, I've been planning on this for a little while now. I actually did not plan to reveal this series to you, but as I was writing the message for this Sunday, I said, you know what? This actually would be the good way to start the series. And so we're, we've been seeing the past month or so um, God has been moving in the church, amen, and, and there have been times where we've had testimonies of healings taking place in the church. Uh, we had, I think, a week or two before Easter, someone got healed of hip, back pain. Um, on Easter Sunday, we prayed for and, and heard testimonies of people getting healed from migraines and vertigo, and so we, I just feel like God wants us to continue to lean in to what he's doing. Let's teach on it, let's learn, and let's grow on it. So this message series is entitled, Signs healed, delivered. Not signed, sealed, committed, or not signed, sealed, delivered, like Stevie Wonder, okay, signs healed, delivered. And I want to look at some of the signs that we see from the Bible, signs of God moving in our life. I want to look at healing and deliverance. I want you to know that healing and deliverance is for your life, amen? It is not just what we read in the Bible and we wait for heaven. It, we can experience heaven on earth here and now. And so we're going to read what the Bible says about this. And we're starting with signs. And, and I'm not talking about asking God to necessarily give us signs. We, we will look at that a little bit. But I want us to think about how do we keep our eyes open to see signs of God at work in our life. And, and sometimes, because if we're not careful, we can mix up and say, I'm going to ask for God for a sign. I'm going to test God with a sign. And we're not really supposed to test God. The Bible makes that very clear. We receive tests. We need tests in order to grow in our faith. But we have to be careful how we treat our relationship with God. Because if we're asking God for things like a sign or a test, sometimes that means we're struggling with some faith and trust in God, right? It's not a sign of a mature relationship. It sounds more like a hostage situation. God, if you will only do this, then I will do this. It also sounds like maybe your relationship with your children sometimes, right? If you will just eat those last two or three pieces of broccoli, then we'll talk about a treat later, okay? If you will just do your homework, your cleaning now, we'll talk about video games later, right? It's not a sign of a mature relationship. And sometimes that's how we approach God. I hear my mom chuckling over there. There might have been, uh, that might have hit too close to home growing up. But I want to look at the times that we have a, we're looking for a confirmation from God. Today's message is entitled Confirmation Bias. Confirmation Bias. Are you, are you familiar with that term? Have you heard of that term before? There's a lot of different biases that can settle in in our life. Think about, uh, maybe you've heard of a recency bias, right? Wh which movie do you like, this one or this one? Well, I just saw this one recently, so I really like that one better. There's a recency bias. You haven't seen the other movie in, in a couple years, so you don't remember it as well. A confirmation bias is something like this. You're seeking out the information that you want to find, <laughs> not that you need to find what you want to find. Let me give you an example as we're in the NBA playoffs right now. If you believe that LeBron James is the greatest player of all time, you will seek out information to back up what you believe. You'll look at the information like, oh, he's got the most points of all time, he's got all this, but then when it comes to the most championships or rings, you don't want to look at that because then Michael Jordan is beating him there, right? It all depends on what you're looking for to try to get the evidence that you want. It's like if a CEO at a company has this grandiose idea, he's going to go look for evidence to back up what he wants. They're not going to look for evidence that would go against what they want. They're looking for a confirmation. This is a confirmation bias. You're getting the point? Getting the idea of it? There's sometimes confirmation biases in our own heads when we go to seek after God. That sometimes we seek God for what we want to hear, what we want to see, instead of what we need to hear and what we need to see. And so today we're going to look at some stories of those who came to God seeking what they wanted to find from God and how God responded. We're going to hop around scripture a little bit, but I want to start at probably one of the most well-known stories of scripture uh, of a person looking for a sign from God in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, I want to look briefly at the sign of the fleece from Gideon. Remember, Gideon asked for a sign from God. If you remember the story, in this part of, of the history of the Israelites, 
Moses has already passed away. The Israelites have gone into the promised land, and they've forgotten about God. They're maybe serving God, but they're also serving this God, and they're worshiping this God, and there's a lot of chaos. And because of this, they're struggling as a nation. And they're struggling as, the, I believe, the Midianites are coming against them. And they're worshiping other gods. And God appears to this man, Gideon, and calls him to lead, lead the Israelites against the Midianites. And look at what God says and how Gideon responds. I'm going to show you these two verses, and then I'll show you the passage of the fleece. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there. We've got it on the screen, and there's always sermon notes available for you on the Church Center homepage and on the YouVersion Bible app. Let's start by reading Judges chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. It says, The Lord said to him, meaning Gideon, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. So here's how we start. Gideon asks simply for a sign and the Lord grants it of him. Gideon brings food, and God brings fire out on a rock, and it consumes the sacrifice. Now, again, later in that same chapter, Gideon asks for another sign known as the sign of the fleece. Let's, let's read that in that passage, uh, verses 36 through 40. Same chapter 6. It says, Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on all the ground there was dew. Gideon here asked for another sign. And another sign. And we often use this passage, I feel like, as a way to get confirmation that we can bring a test before God and he'll respond. But I'm not sure that's actually a good example of what our relationship with God should look like. And how we should ask him to confirm things in our life because it shows a lack of faith. God had already appeared as the angel of the Lord to Gideon. He's already told him, you're a mighty man of God. He's already done a sign in front of him. What else do you want? Gideon was struggling, and he asked for a second and even a third sign. Because Gideon's first, actually, uh, it goes into the nature of how science and how things work with the fleece on the ground. And honestly, for me, I don't know about for you, but for me, this is probably one of the most relatable passages in Scripture I feel like I would, I would do the same thing of asking God because I would not have my science right. I would not know my biology or whatever. And I would ask God to do something of how he already set up the world to run. Anybody else feel that way? Uh, I feel like when God asked, or when Gideon asked that of God, God was like, okay, that's already how I have it set up. Sure, it was, sure, yes, done. That's how it'll happen. I feel like I would ask something similar in a prayer. I'd be like, God, today, if this is really true, if this is really you, will you let the sun come out in the east and set in the west this day? And God would be like, yes, I do that every day, sure. And I'd go back and be like, God, actually, sorry, I forgot how that works. Can you have the sun rise in the west and set in the east as a sign to me this day? I don't know about anybody else, but when I saw that, that was relatable for me. But even in this moment, God was gracious enough to give Gideon both of those signs. But I think Gideon knew in the moment that this wasn't something he should have been asking. Notice he says, God, please don't be angry with me for asking this. Notice he says, please, he, he's begging God for another sign. And I don't say all these things to bring down Gideon or say, what's wrong with you, Gideon? Because we all struggle time to time and, and want signs and confirmation. We all struggle. And of course, God was asking a very big thing from Gideon. And he was struggling with faith. 
But it's better to have little faith than to have no faith. The Bible talks about different measures of faith. I'd rather have little faith. I'd rather have the faith the size of a mustard seed than have no faith. And so he listened, and he, he listened, and he blessed Gideon with both of these signs. But I want to make sure that I communicate signs from God are a good thing. Okay? They are a blessing to help us, and God freely gives his signs to us all throughout the Bible. Think about the rainbow as a sign from God to Noah and his family. He would never destroy the earth with a flood again. Think about the sign of the burning bush to Moses to connect, connect him, get a hold of him, that God was trying to, to talk to and bring the Israelites out of slavery. Think about the New Testament. When the angels came to the shepherds, Telling about the baby, Jesus said, this will be a sign unto you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, cloths, and lying in a manger. Think about Jesus. Remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he said to them, these signs will follow those who believe. These signs will follow those who believe. Signs are meant to follow belief, not create our belief. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. God gives signs throughout the Bible, and I believe he gives signs to us here today as well. But I also believe that our faith cannot be built on what we see. As we go through this series on signs and healing and deliverance, there are going to be some tough questions. And I'm not going to have all the answers. I don't know why God moves in certain situations and he doesn't in other areas. I don't know why he heals sometimes and not other times. But we've all had this question of, God, why didn't you heal in this moment? God, I know if you just healed them right now, they would all of a sudden know that you have healed them and they would turn their life over to you. Are you sure about that? Do you know that for sure? Because people in the Bible saw signs, healings, and wonders all the time. The Israelites saw all the time, and yet they still went and worshipped other gods. Signs are not meant to start our belief in Jesus. They're following our belief and our faith in Jesus. Because what happens on the day that we don't receive a sign or a healing? If our faith is built on those signs, our faith will be gone when the signs disappear. Our faith has to be in something greater, something that goes on and on, even when we don't see God working like we want to. Gideon here is asking for a sign. You know who else asked for a sign? Thomas. Doubting Thomas. He said, I will not believe until I see the nail marks in his, in his hands. And I love so many times Jesus is, is way more merciful to us than we deserve. He says, all right, I'll show you. But blessed are those who don't see this. And yet they still believe. Do you know who else asked for a sign from Jesus? Actually asked for three signs from Jesus? The devil. The devil asked for signs from Jesus. Remember Matthew chapter 4 verse 3. It says, The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil came looking for a sign, tempting Jesus to have trust and faith in himself instead of in God. Jesus had the power to cause stones to become bread. He had the power to have angels protect him. But the Bible says he only did what he saw the Father doing. He only spoke what he heard the Father speaking. And so if God was not doing it, Jesus was not going to do it. The devil was tempting him to have faith in something other than God. And the way that Jesus was going to combat this, attempt, this temptation from the enemy was he said, it is written. Three things I want us to be aware of before we're asking for signs from God. Number one, study scripture before looking for a sign. Study the scriptures. We have the word of God at our disposal. It is our first line of defense against any type of confirmation bias. It's our first line of defense against a world and a culture that is continuing to blur the line between what is right and what is wrong. And notice I said study the scripture. I didn't say just look at it, give it a glance, maybe read it. Study the scripture. Know what it means. 
Know the context. Know what the spirit-inspired authors of the Bible were intending, because even the devil could say scripture. He actually, in one of those temptations, he quoted scripture to Jesus, but he didn't know the meaning. Study the scriptures to know what it means. We have to study and understand because it will help us determine what is God's will and what is my own bias. The word of God can ground you and protect you. Because you can't tell me that what God is telling you is okay if you're grounded in the word of God. You, you can't tell someone it's okay to step out on my spouse if I'm grounded in the word of God. You can't say it's okay to go out and get drunk if you're grounded in the word of God. You can't say it's okay to live my lifestyle however I want to. You can't say the homosexual lifestyle lines up with the word of God if you're grounded in what the word of God says. This is why our culture is struggling. Because they're picking and choosing what parts they want to read and believe, and they're throwing away the rest. We have to understand, we have to be grounded in what the Word of God, the confirmation bias, has invaded our culture. And we desire to see signs from God, and in the process, we've ignored the Word of God. When questions, thoughts, and ideas come to our mind, we have to sift them first through the Word of God. Studying what He said. There will be people that come up to me and ask for advice with situations in their life, couples, singles, whoever. And I give them some advice if I can, if God helps me, because I don't have all the answers. But do you know where I start? I said, okay, well, have you read the Bible recently? Have you prayed recently about this? No? Maybe you should start there. Maybe before you come to me, you should go and ask God. <laughs> go to the source instead of me. This is where we have to start. All right, I'll move on. <laughs> After the sign of Gideon, I, I want to look at the book of Numbers. That's right, I said the book of Numbers. Uh, we all look at the book of, I heard groans over here, the book of Numbers. There are good things in the book of Numbers. When Moses and the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, and the people of Moab were afraid of the Israelites, they had heard rumors of the power of their God. And so the king of Moab sends a prophet. He's attempting to send a prophet named Balaam to speak and prophesy against the Israelites. So there's a group of elders that come out to Balaam and, and they have this proposal. Here's what Balaam says in response to their proposal. Numbers chapter 22, starting in verse 8, it says this. Balaam spoke to the priests and he said, Lodge here tonight and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me saying, behold, a people has come out of Egypt and it covers the face of the earth. Talking about the Israelites here. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. In this moment, Balaam is faced with an attractive offer. But Balaam heard clearly from God and reported what God spoke to him. Right? God said it very clearly. Do not go. Do not curse them. They are blessed. Those are the three sentences he basically said. Balaam only knows this because he has taken time to get away and to seek God. We can only hear from God as we take time to get away from the noise and the distractions and seek God. Number two in our confirmation bias. Seek the Spirit before looking for a sign. Study Scripture. Seek the Spirit. If we want to know what God wants for our lives, we have to take time to get alone with Him. In prayer. In our prayer closet. Away from the noise. I know this seems like a novel idea. 
But how many times would we say there's a big decision in our life, it comes up right away, immediately, everything's urgent, right? Everything's like, it has to be done now. We have to know this now. Balaam said, stay here for the night. I'm going to go talk to God, and I'm going to bring back whatever he says. I'm going to bring it to you. We have to be willing to say, pause. I need some prayer time. I need to think about this. Think about different salespeople that come up to you. you got to do this right now. The sale is right now. If you wait, do you want to know why they don't want you to wait? Because you'll go back and think, I probably don't need a fifth blender. Um, I probably don't need another this. If I really think about this clearly, how much more clearly can we think when we give it to God in prayer, taking our time to pause, seek God to protect you from confirmation bias? Take the time to actually sit there and wait. Don't make a brash decision. Seek God. And sometimes in this opportunity, sometimes moments like this actually feel like they're a blessing from God. Right? This came out of nowhere. This, this has to be a sign that God loves Balaam. He, he's offering him money and position. The favor of the Lord is here. Sometimes we do this in our life, right? But not every good opportunity that comes our way is a God opportunity. Not, not always is the first thing that comes our way the best thing that comes our way. Let me step away from a spiritual story for a second just to give you a practical story. Steve Jobs, in the early 1980s, he was offered the position at PepsiCo to be the head of their, of their company, to be uh, the head of, I think, the p p president of their operations. That was the title. And Steve Jobs, at the moment, he was just kind of tinkering with this small, not well-known company called Apple. And he, he was struggling there. But Jobs said famously, maybe you've heard this quote, he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? Steve Jobs knew what he was building there was greater than the offer in front of him. But the offer in front of him would give him immediate financial security immediate high position, but the best opportunity is not always the first opportunity. A good opportunity is not always a God opportunity. Think about Joseph in the Bible. He had a good opportunity, right? He had power. He had authority. He even had the boss's wife throwing herself at him. And Joseph said, no, I'd rather be thrown in prison and be with God what he wants. I know this is not what God's will is for my life. I'm going to go the other way. Think about Moses. He was in the family, he was in the courts of Pharaoh. He said, no, I'd rather be with my own people struggling in oppression, following God, than following a good opportunity. And I wish for Balaam, I wish this was the end of the story for him. But after declining Balak's men the first time, let's continue to read the rest of the story. Verse 15, it says this, once again, Balak sent princes more in number, and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor, and whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you, too, please, please stay here tonight, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. So here's the second time that princes are sent to Balaam. And Balaam goes back to ask God for an answer. Why? Why would he do that? He's already sought the Lord on this. God already said it very clearly, right? Do not go. Do not curse them. They are blessed. So why go back again? I wonder if Balaam was saying all the right things, but in his heart, he desired to go. He desired the wealth that they had to offer him, the power and the authority that they had to offer him. And what does God say? 
Well, the men have called you. Go ahead and rise with them. You clearly desire what they want more than what I'm telling you. And if I had any questions, if I had any debates on this, like was, it, was God angry? Was he happy? I look at the next verse and I know very clearly. Verse 22, it says, after Balaam has left with him, it says, but God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. I don't know if you've read that before, and I'm sitting there uh, contemplating, I'm like, oh man, that's tough, is it this, is it that? And I just keep reading, oh, very clearly, God did not want Balaam to go. That was not God's will for Balaam. God had already told him not to go. But here's the scary thing. If we continue to ask things of God and show what our heart desires, God is a gentleman, he's not going to force his will on anybody, and he'll say, sure, if that's what you keep asking for, go ahead and do it. I'm not going to stop you. It's clearly not my will. I've already told you what my will is. But God allows us to follow our hearts, which is very scary. And that's why number three, as we remind ourselves against a confirmation bias, number three, search your heart before looking for a sign. We need to search our heart for the confirmation bias. Because Balaam was not being honest with his desires. He wanted God to give him a word and a sign but he wanted to give him the word and the sign that he wanted. We have to search our hearts and know what we are desiring and test our hearts to see if we have pure intentions and desires. Here are some questions we need to ask ourselves in prayer. Why am I asking God for this sign? Have I aligned my thoughts with God's word? Have I taken time to pause and seek, and, and seek God for this. How will I feel? Here's an important one. How am I going to feel if this goes one way? And how am I going to feel if it actually goes another way? A lot of times for me, that will show what's in my heart. Oh, I, I really want to go a certain way. God, please search my heart. I want your will. I know I want it this way. But I want, more importantly, what you want for my life. That's why David said this in Psalm 139. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any previous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Another version, if that is confusing, a previous way, it means pull, point out anything in me that offends you, God. Search me. David gave God permission to search him and know his heart and his thoughts. Additionally, some translations don't just say, know my thoughts. It says, know my anxious thoughts. Well, why is that important? Because a lot of times anxiety is what pushes us away from God's will. A lot of times anxiety is saying, I, trust, I, I, I struggle to trust in you, God, in this situation. And that, that's why I'm dealing with anxiety. Now, of course, we all have fears. There are things that we struggle with. But sometimes we have to be willing to surrender that to God. I encourage you to invite God to know your thoughts because he knows them regardless. But you're saying, God, I, I'm an open book. I'm opening my heart to you. Get rid of the things in my life that don't please you. Cleanse my heart. We can't trust our heart. You want to know why I know that? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. It says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Why does David say to search and know our hearts? Because you cannot trust your heart. You cannot trust your heart. I know it sounds like the right thing to say. Go with your gut. Follow your heart. Have you heard that before? Oh, follow. You have to follow your heart. We've heard that before. It sounds like the right thing, but I promise you it will not serve you well. It will lead you down the wrong path. What happens when we're trying to listen to God, but we're not careful to guard our heart and we don't invite God to search our heart is we get a confirmation bias. And then we say things like, God told me to do this. 
God t- told me to say this, we play the God card without actually taking time to have our hearts searched and know that it's God's will. The mindset that if my heart wants it, then God must want it is a very, very dangerous place to be. We're then getting into the moment of the concern what we talked about in communion of idolatry. We're not actually following God. We're building God to make him what we want him to be, what we want him to say. God gives signs to his people all throughout scripture. He will confirm his word and his will to us. And we need to be prepared to receive the sign from God with our hearts prepared to listen, to receive what we need to hear, not what we're wanting to hear. Worship team, would you come up and join? And actually, church, would you stand as we get ready to close? The worship team is just going to play a soft song behind us. And and I want to actually turn this into a moment of prayer. It's not going to be a long time. We're not going to draw this out. But one moment, an opportunity to pray and ask God to search our hearts to know, is there some sort of confirmation bias? Is there something that's blocking me from what God's will really is for my life. And I'm just gonna give you an opportunity as we close. You can stand there at your, at your seat, you can sit down, you can kneel, but I'm begging you to take one moment and ask God, I'm gonna actually ask you boldly if you would audibly say, God, search my heart. Actually, let's do this together, let's pray this together. We're gonna pray Psalm 139 together. Would you pray this? Say, search me, O God, know my heart, Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in my life that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Maybe there's a situation in your life, there's something going on that you have a decision to make and you're struggling with a confirmation bias. I encourage you before we leave, let's just take two minutes and pray and give God a chance to speak into our hearts this morning. God, I pray that you help us to rid ourselves of the confirmation bias, our own desires. I pray, God, that we would be a people grounded in scripture. I pray that you would draw up a hunger in our hearts to read and to understand. I pray that you would bring fresh revelation this week as we pray, as we read your word. That we would take it for what you're saying for our life and our situations. I pray that we'd be people that we would seek the spirit. That we'd be people that can stand on our feet because we first have been on our knees seeking you and asking for your will in life. And God, I pray that you would purify our hearts and our desires. We say this morning, search our hearts and know us. Rid us of our anxiety and our fear. Increase my faith and my trust that I don't have to look for a sign because I've been reading the word, I've been in scripture, I've been studying, I've been seeking the spirit of God and my heart is aligned with yours. Lead us in the way of everlasting life. Test our heart to know you. We thank you for this privilege to come before you, to be honest, to be vulnerable, and to desire you more than our own ways, our own will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Are you glad for God's blessing over your life? You're going to follow him this week. I encourage you, get into the word of God. I know we're, what, four months into this year, and there are times in January where we're excited. I'm ready to read the word of God, and then month after month, we hit Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, and it gets more difficult. But I encourage you, get into the word of God. Be grounded in scripture and in your prayer life. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope to see you again soon.